All right, we're recording now. So I am here with Derek Jones, and we just got his new book in, Cricket Tables. So uh, you can't miss this one across the room, but we wanted to ask him a few questions about the book and about cricket tables in general. So let's start with the big one. Does this book answer why they are called cricket tables? Yes. It's a one word. No, it, it, it does. It goes. It's a long-winded um, sort of journey to get to that point. And to be honest, in actual fact, there's no real um, solid cast iron answer. It's just what we expect may have happened um, hundreds of years ago, and how the English language kind of morphs and changes, and we beg, borrow, and steal phrases and words from other languages. And that's that's really how the term cricket came into the English language anyway, and it's, it's not rocket science to really see how that um, found its way into sort of furniture uh, descriptions. So it doesn't have anything to do with the game? Absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the game. <laughs> the, only, the only similarities are that uh, the stumps used in cricket are three sticks, and the legs that make up the earlier versions of cricket, stable, uh, cricket tables are made out of three sticks. That's the only comparison there is between the two. Mm. And yet it seems to be a mostly British form, as far as we know over here in America, but your book actually traces it to a few other places, yeah? Yes, it does, yeah. Um, the ones that I'm more familiar with, we sort of class them with, as um, tavern tables. They're the ones with rectangular legs, rectang triangular legs, I should mm. say. Um, and there's obviously the stick version. The stick version, I don't think you could say that's um, that's uniquely British or English. It's such a sim simple form. It could have come from anywhere, really. Mm. But the tavern tables with the triangular legs, that's definitely something that um, appears predominantly in English furniture culture. Mm. Um, but you traced one of them back to uh, the Dutch, right? The croc, I can't say it, crocostool? Oh, I'm I'm going to try and say it as well. Uh, both of us will be shot down by the Dutch, I'm sure. I, I'm led to believe that the old Dutch word for stick is something like crook. And uh, the old crook French stool. word for stick is something like creek. Mm. So when you consider the um, uh, the rate at which England was not invaded, but we had visitors from overseas bringing their languages with them mm. um that's really how we get to cricket it's it's a it's a mashup of dutch and and french and english to eventually end up with something like cricket gotcha from click and crook so we i said it wrong sorry sorry matthias i know there's at least one dutch person watching this yes. and i feel bad about that but not that he's watching but that i can't say it properly Anyway, um, can you tell us why we should care about cricket tables and how you first got interested in the form? Um, how I first got interested in the form, it's, it's funny, I've seen hundreds, thousands of pieces of furniture. And even, you know, during my tenure at, at um, furniture and cabinet making, I used to go and um, judge competitions and go to exhibitions and see lots and lots of pieces of furniture. And... There are very few pieces that I've seen in my career that actually move me in some mm. way. And art has much the same effect. If it doesn't move you, it's just it's just gathering dust. And the cricket table that I saw that kind of got me excited had that same attraction as, as there were only a handful of pieces of furniture in my career have ever done. And it just it sounds hippy dippy it just spoke to me mm -hmm. and I can't be any more specific than that um, and that's why I got so passionately involved with making them and seeing well why is, you know what is it saying to me or am I just excited about the construction or well, not really the basic ones aren't really that complicated to make um, until you get onto the the ones with triangular legs and they really mess with my head because mm -hmm. having spent all my life making effectively case furniture, so 90 degrees and square, the occasional 45, to suddenly try and make something like a cricket table with rake and splay and new angles, it was a really humbling experience because, uh, you know, I thought I would be able to make it quite easily. How wrong <laughs> was I? I mean, it wasn't like, you know, it, it took me several to get comfortable with it. And even now I have to have to be on my um, uh, my A game to make a good cricket table with the triangle legs. 
with the ones that are not triangular legs uh, that are just the rake and splay that you're dealing with, is it much like a chair and that it's okay if one is off by one degree from the other, will it still work together? In other words, could a beginner build the simpler form of this and work their way up, do you think? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, they look really nice when they're perfect, but at the same time, if they're too perfect, hmm. they don't have the same appeal. Mm -hmm. I've made lots of my own cricket tables and I kind of assess them against my own benchmark. But when I've uh, run classes with them and other people make those cricket tables, it's it's fantastic for me to watch them make something that still works, no matter how rusty their joinery is. It's not mm -hmm. perfect. It is just a, a one off and everything we make um, by hand is a one off effectively. And, and there's nothing wrong with them being slightly wonky. Um, if they don't have exactly the same splay because those three legs, uh, when they're um, when it's a stick style table, um, the rake or uh, the splay comes on a radial line to the center to the um, to the outside. So it's not really rake and splay as you would have on a chair with mm. compound angles and things like that. It's just one splay angle mm. on a radial line. If they don't go together perfectly, it's not the end of the world. Um, and even if one leg does kink out further than the others, it'll still sit level three legs always sit level you know that mm. yeah i've seen you teach this a couple of times now in our shop here and it is uh, amazing to see the variation at the end of the day uh yeah. they all look good they all look like tables that you can put a yeah. cup of tea on or coffee in our case probably <laughs> more often so the one that first attracted you was it a tavern table style with the triangular legs or was it the more simple form no it was the tavern table triangular mm -hmm. legs yeah. So how did you work your way from there back to the uh, more, I say basic, but uh, perhaps easier to make stick style? Um, probably did a lot of Googling in actual fact. I mean, that's <laughs> the first time I've seen, I've seen that. Well, that's it. It couldn't possibly, possibly have been the first time I'd seen it because mm. I'd been in the antiques trade for years and years. And just that type of furniture was never really on my radar. Brown furniture, Georgian Edwardian furniture was really my... Mm. Um, my, my stock in trade so that kind of oak uh, furniture country now we sort of um, get familiar with the term vernacular that yeah. wasn't on my radar at all so I must have seen them because they were prolific mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't something that um, um, uh, that was familiar when I saw it and maybe that's that was part of the hook mm. um, and it wasn't until I thought cricket tables that's interesting and I jumped to the same conclusions as everybody else <laughs> that maybe it was named after the game cricket um, and I just got inquisitive, did some research, looked at the earliest cricket tables, uh, looked at the origins, orange, oranges, the <laughs> origins, origins, <laughs> the origins, the hard work. Of, yeah, the origins <laughs> of the, the game cricket and realized that there was, you know, the, the things weren't gelling. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's what led me down that rabbit hole to see where does the name come from how far yeah. do they go back and you couldn't you can't help but stumble over all the various forms that are out there mm -hmm. well why do you think other people should build them why should um, they buy your book derek that you've spent at least two or three years of your life working on what is important about this book that you want people to know what are they going to learn what are you going to learn um i think you're going to learn to take your foot off the gas as far as um <laughs> precision is concerned Yes, there's a place for precision. Yes, there's a place for fine cabinet work, but there's also um, a place for, in actual fact, putting all that to one side and just building by the seat of your pants and not really worrying too much about the quality of the joinery. You've got to be a little bit picky about some of the um, uh, the timber you select for those parts, not that they're anywhere near as um, sort of stressed as uh, a chair, a piece of seating furniture. But uh, even so, we need to make sure that they will actually stand the test of time. And I just think it's a really fun way to get your head around making vernacular furniture because everyone is going to be unique. There are no blueprints. Nobody ever did any drawings of them. And what's interesting, uh, furniture of the, the same period, um, speaking to a few antique dealers in my research for the book, no one has ever seen a cricket table that's got a signature on there or a mark or a maker's name, nothing. They were never signed. They were never seen as being worthy of anybody owning. So it kind of suggests that they were made by people that were going to use them. Mm. And very rarely 
made with a view to being sold or made for somebody else as a commission. That's a really interesting concept and sort of keep that tradition going. And I think that's that's why cricket tables are important to have as our, our repertoire as furniture makers. Hmm. So I see a lot of cricket tables come up on, say, Tim and Betts and Bowen's uh, site on Instagram, yep. the name of which is escaping me, Welsh Vernacular Furniture. Is that right? Well, I'll look it up and we'll flash it on the screen. Anyway, yeah. um, in here you've presented, so you have a chapter on the variations, but then you present three different forms to build. What are those forms and why did you choose those three? Um, the first one I think was was uh, quite a straightforward um, stick style with a, uh, a T-section stretcher mm -hmm. arrangement underneath. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll flash those up on the screen to show people, but yeah. Okay, good idea. Um, that's the simplest form to get your head around, to be perfectly honest. I mean, you can't make too many mistakes with that and you'll <laughs> still end up with a very acceptable cricket table. Good fun mm -hmm. to make. Don't have to be picky about the material. Uh, you can... Uh, go straight down to your big box store and work with um, stock pieces which you can buy off the shelf, join them together. And honestly, by the time you get home or within an hour of getting home, you could be making a table. There's no preparation to be done. You literally, you buy the timber off the shelf, take it home, and you're making straight away. Uh, the second project, that involves some steaming and some turning. Now, I've only ever made a couple of cricket tables that have that style, um, steam, steamed legs mm -hmm. to bow them out and a turned top. It's unusual, mm. uh, certainly unusual for me. And what's more unusual for me is that I don't do a lot of steaming and I'm not a wood turner. <laughs> so what it forced me to do is to work with craftsmen, artisans, local to me and say, hey, I want to make this table. Can you help me out? And I love working with other furniture makers. Um, and you learn an awful lot from them mm -hmm. um, about the way they work. They can influence some of the decisions that I would make, um, um, you know, to, to do with those tables. Uh, and it's just a great way to build furniture. We tend to work an awful lot isolated. Mm -hmm. um, we get caught up in our own ideas and sometimes we can get too far um, into our own ideas and too precious about it. This is a great way of relinquishing that hold on everything you do and not being such a control freak and letting somebody <laughs> else have a decision over thickness and taper and mortises and all those sorts of things. Yes, you can specify it, but I wouldn't dream of telling a, a, a good competent <laughs> wood turner the dimensions and how things should be. They've got a lot more experience in that part of the process than I have, so mm. why not draw on that? I mean, that's, mm. that's a great way to make anything. Um, the last one, combination of turning that's a tavern table i could have done it with straight triangular legs and that's fun to do uh but the nicest tavern tables and i guess that's one of those those nicest what does that mean i mean it just looked good on the day maybe my opinion changes from day hmm. to day like it does with all of us but that's a triangular shape that is the difficult one to put together and i think it's the third project in the book so hmm. yes there's a natural progression the one in the middle is a red herring, experiment with it. And I'd like to encourage people to link up with other makers and other trades and uh, and mm. get to know them and use them. That's interesting that you say that because that is a more European and English approach to building. I don't think there are as many, say, professional turners here. Here yeah. we are more likely to borrow our friend's lathe if we don't have one and, and try it ourselves because we just don't excuse me, have the tradition of those trades being separate uh, because yeah. it was, there was never the apprenticeship programs here that you had there and that they still have in Germany and such. Um, yeah. So that, that, that was interesting to me in particular to read that section because find your local turner. Hmm, I don't know how to do that, but <laughs> it doesn't mean they aren't there. And you can certainly link up with people, say, at, a, at, at your woodworking club or on, in a Facebook group or something as a way to reach out and you know, share your project with other people, which you're right. We do tend to work in our own little spaces and not get out much. Mm. I mean, look at me, yeah. I'm in this dark space right now. I know, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I turn the light on, it looks like I'm in a horror movie. Ooh, so ooh, yeah. that's out. Um, oh, sorry, I keep getting a text here, of course. Um, 
Uh, somebody asked about one of the ones you've shown in uh, when you were, you've been writing about it on our blog, and that is one that looks a lot like the uh, simpler stick version, but it has a table down underneath atop those sticks. Do you remember this one at all? Again, yep. I'll flash it up on the screen. So it has a pewter cup on top and a, uh, 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 what do you call this? Candle. candle. A candle, yes. Yep. <clears throat> yep. How, do, how um, would one go about doing uh, that and other variations? How would you encourage taking the ones you've taught us to build and then making them your own? And that might be an option there, that little lower table. Yeah. Um, uh, in, in, in some circles of, of vernacular furniture in, in the history books, uh, we class that, that that board is a pot board. Mm. Uh, and that can be on a dresser. It can be in in, uh, in any kind of um, sort of storage furniture. The pot board is the one right on, on on the bottom. Sometimes the baseboard, the bottom board, but we invariably call it the pot board. Is that where you um, put a pot, or <laughs> exactly? Okay. Yes, yeah. I mean that's where you keep the biggest pot. Uh, in some large pieces of furniture, that might be where the dog sleeps. I mean, it, it, it could be <laughs> anything, but it's we often refer to it as the pot board. Mm. So that bottom shelf or that lower. It is really a, a shelf or a board to strung across three stretches. Mm. Sometimes they're tapped underneath, which is an easier way to go because mm -hmm. you're dealing with a, a wider space. Imagine our, our legs are tapered. It's much easier to come in from the bottom and tack it up underneath. So then what you end up with is just a little a frieze or framework around the outside of that pot board that sticks up so nothing slides off. Mm -hmm. uh, the harder way of doing it is to put something down, but that involves you going between the legs folding it and coming down that's trickier to get mm. really nice cutouts around the inside mm -hmm. profiles of those legs but that's another way of doing it um you'd find it hard to do with one piece of timber mm. much easier to do with two because you can then bring them down and, and they pop into place finally mm -hmm. like what uh, other variations have you seen that, that you like um rather than that t-section uh you can have a, a central um nut or or component and three stretches would come off of that. Mm -hmm. That kind of style tends to come in later. And when I say later, we're looking at um, sort of end of the 18th century, uh, 19th century, because it's got closer links with um, Edwardian furniture mm -hmm. and later Renaissance furniture, that kind of thing. But it's not to say they weren't around much earlier, mm -hmm. but they were much rarer earlier than other variants. And that kind of construction comes in a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, there's there's lots you can do there. We can have round legs. We can have um, uh, octagonal legs. We can just have square legs with the corners taken off chamfers. We can taper them fat, um, sort of narrow to thin and back the other way. Uh, we can have turned legs. You can have mm -hmm. steamed legs to bend them out. And we can do those rectangular legs, rectangular legs with turnings. Mm -hmm. I mean, the you know, there's there there's so many different options there. Once you mix sure. them up, I'm not going to say this this um, um, uh, you know, I'm can't kind of think of the word I'm after. I'm not going to say that there's unlimited variations, but there's mm -hmm. enough to keep you going. Right, and with the three legs, you can play around with just about anything, and it'll still stand, as you said Absolutely, earlier. Absolutely, right? yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing that I that gives me greatest um, variation, in actual fact, is playing with that that degree angle, that spray mm -hmm. angle. Mm -hmm. uh, when I wrote the book, I think I was working with any religions or six and I worked all the way up to nine degrees. Well, mm -hmm. that's when I wrote the book. That's when I did those first few projects. They're the other ones that were photographed and, and used for the book. I'm now up to 12 degrees. Mm -hmm. I never right. thought I'd go. I never thought I'd go into double figures, but here I am into 12 degrees. OK, it's not a <laughs> huge leap, but we know those one or two degrees really do change the way that a piece of furniture sits and stands. And sure. of course. It affects the um, the position of the legs. Do the legs suddenly have to move inwards because you've got more splay? We don't want those feet to to end up outside the perimeter of the top. Mm. So just playing around with one or two degrees, if you you know if you made three tables all with different degree and different splay angles, they would have really different personality. Mm. You mentioned yeah. the top. Are the tops always round? All the ones I've seen are round, but I'm only looking at them through the lens of editing your book. So. Um, have you ever um, seen any with variations on that? If I did, I wouldn't recognize them as cricket tables. I'm, gotcha. I'm just going to put a line in the sand and say <laughs> at some point, because there are so many variations, we've got to put 
we yeah. <laughs> i've got to put a <laughs> lid on it and say we don't go beyond this point because if you do how can that be a cricket table it's just another three-legged table so i'm mm. i've tried to corral everybody to assume that cricket tables have round tops <laughs> what about size size so size um, variation do you see so so most of the ones in the book have smaller uh tops on them but i know yep. some of the variations had a little bit wider tops what do you think is the size limit of this form could one use it for a, a dining table say which i know is a crazy question but i'll let you answer yeah it, right? um i can't remember seeing one in the flesh or even online researching that is a lot bigger than I'm going to say, let's just give you a measurement you'll be familiar with, two foot, maybe two and, a, two and a half feet across. I mean, that's, I would say that's about the limit. A majority mm. are two foot across and smaller. Mm. I say across, two foot diameter and smaller. Mm -hmm. And the majority are on the smaller side to the larger side. I can't think of any reason why you couldn't make a dining table size one but you'd have to beef up the legs and yeah. the joinery might be different and you'd um, absolutely have to have a robust undercarriage or uh stretchers underneath too i would think absolutely yes yeah so i i think you know by um just the proportions of the of the timber you're going to use and the construction lends itself to a small delicate side table mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and you've got that splay too. So if you get it too big, it's going to want to do that if you have too much weight on top of it. Yes. So. Yeah. Yeah. How much weight can these hold, would you say? I know we haven't tested it or anything, but, you know, <laughs> could my, my heavy cat jump on top of it, for example? And Your heavy cat yeah. could certainly jump on top <laughs> of it. But um, interesting, for the first time, we, we've had a cricket table in in. Um, <laughs> A cricket table. We've had cricket tables <laughs> in our living room for quite some time, and um, for the first time in 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 many years of having them, our cat sat on the side of the cricket table. And if you do get too close to oh, it, they will right. tip over. <laughs> yeah, so we heard this awful clatter at about two in the morning oh, when they're oh running no. downstairs, and there was uh, the cat sort of walking around as if he'd done nothing. But there was the of course, <laughs> of course, they do. That's what they do, isn't it? Right. Could one, uh, well, my cat would absolutely tip it over. If I moved the legs out a little bit then and brought the splay in a little, I, there'd be ways to work around that if that might be an issue, right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What is your uh, favorite form of cricket table that you've ever built? Uh, favorite form, the one I'm warming most to is triangular legs. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's the one that appears right at the front of the book, almost on the, one of those first one or two pages. Okay, now I'm I'm opening the book and having a look. Yeah. Oh, this one here. That one there. Yes. What is it that you like about that? Um, the the new way of attaching the top here. I know you've been I playing around that. with that. I absolutely love that. It's yeah. so crude. It's so simple. Can't understand why I haven't. Well, I know exactly why I haven't done it before because it's so crude and so simple. And <laughs> sometimes we try and make things more complicated than they need to be. Mm. Um, and that's, you know, when it, like, I did that the first time again when I was over with you, but it wasn't at Lost Art Press. It was somewhere else. Um, I had some time on my hands, finished the course quickly and thought, hey, let's give this a go. I've been meaning to do it mm. at home. Had the um uh, the materials and the wherewithal to do it so uh put it together went together very well um and i'll be making more cricket tables like that i mean that's that's what i'm working on next mm. the the way that you've attached that there actually reminds me of say a shaker round table they often have a shaped uh support underneath that both helps to hold it flat helps you connect two boards together and then helps you connect it to the whatever the stand is underneath so yeah, it's, yeah. It's, I mean, it, it's it's doing double duty, isn't it? It's doing mm -hmm. a lot of different things all at the same time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, I guess, it would make it more sturdy for the cat. As long as they chose the edge <laughs> where that was sticking out, it would be all right, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, how long have you been making these? How long have you been working on this book? Oh, because um, I'm trying to remember when you first approached us about it. It's been a couple of years. Yeah. You know? It's been a couple of years. I was probably making them in 2019. Hmm. Yeah, about 2019, I think.
So it actually yes. hasn't been that long, really. Yeah, I mean, in the grand yeah, scheme maybe, of the book world. Do you know, right? I'm, I'm the worst person to ask about dates <laughs> and times. I mean, I, I was traveled, you know, keeping up with today, what today's date is, but, right. in English, but it could be 2019, could be earlier than that. Mm. I'll have to go back and, and check. Well, the only reason I'm asking is because you mentioned that now after having written the book, you've moved on to a couple other forums. Um, yeah. you know, it, it does take a while to get a book done. And by the time this book comes out, you're probably five iterations ahead of what's going on in here. Um, yeah, yeah. Because you have built these three forums and uh, variations on them. So now you're exploring it further. If somebody wanted to follow your journey of exploration on, on new versions of this forum, where could they see that? Um, the most, the easiest, easiest place to find it is on my Instagram account, Low Fat Rubo. Okay. Uh, I tend to, I tend to post. I very rarely, I can't imagine, I can't remember the last time I put anything on Facebook uh, purposely. <laughs> although obviously things do get uploaded onto Facebook eventually, or they mm -hmm. go up at the same time. But Instagram is the best place. Um, I don't have any plans right now, although I'm open to offers to do stuff elsewhere. But you know, I'm quite happy with Instagram, and that's um try and answer as many questions as I can. If people want to um, um, message me down there or put something in the comments, I may not do it immediately, but I'll always sure. try and get back to you. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, it is fun seeing what you're working on now, you know, because I'm used to what's in this book. So how can I, how can I take that further? So following you would be a good way yeah. to learn that. So that's Absolutely. at low fat Rubo, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And the explain, one I'm explain on... that moniker for, for us. Why don't you, <laughs> why are you low, low fat, fat Rubo? Rubo. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, long time ago. <laughs> okay, I'll try and um, I'll give you the pod history of low fat rubo. A long time ago, I was editing a magazine, as you know. Mm. Uh, David Barron, who's a well known tool maker, furniture maker, yep. uh, wrote three articles for me for the magazine, mm. and they're about benches. The first one was a, a Scandinavian bench, the second one was something else, and the third one was a, a rubo bench. Mm -hmm. So he takes uh, photographs of his rubo bench project and several others, and he sends them to me. And this was going back a few years. Sure. The photographs he sent me were little thumbnails, useless, couldn't use them in the magazine at all. So hmm. we had to come up with um, uh, a compromise because by then we committed to running the article in the magazine. We'd done the drawings, the pages mm. were laid out, all we needed sure. was. Uh, decent size I know photo. how that goes <laughs> yeah exactly yes yeah um so David was then going off to I think the first hand works mm. so you can put a date to that yourself somewhere he's going off to the first hand work 2015 have, or so yeah okay didn't have access to uh, the images so my only course of action was to go down to the timber yard oh no and buy some, yeah and buy some image <laughs> and make a rubo bench but there's no way i was going to make that in the time i had no <laughs> so i thought i'll just make a rubo bench that's got one leg and i won't ever finish the boards with photographic so you don't <laughs> see the tail end and it's cheating all smoke and mirrors you know how yeah, it's yeah, done yeah. no nope, never done it nope never done that <laughs> no, I mean, no, just, no, no, just no. me okay. just you yep yeah so <laughs> i got half a fill of project and i thought hang on a minute um, um a pine top with pine legs is southern yellow pine this isn't too bad, you know. I mean, it's no, it's certainly not a rubo bench, but right, the right. construction was very similar. It works. So, to I finished the project and I did put four legs on it. It's actually the Good bench I use now yeah. in my bench in my workshop. Mm -hmm. um, but I had to come up for a headline for the sure. um, tagline for the article. So we just called it the low fat <laughs> rubo because gotcha. it was still a rubo. Mm -hmm. it, cost half the price and it weighs a lot less than a regular rubo but it's still heavier than new you know sure it, it, sure it's, it's the bill i'm just sure uh, i'm not the I'm only not one who's wondered that so <laughs> yeah well so that's no, that's where it came from yeah <laughs> gotcha well we're almost out of time here so we should get back to cricket tables so yeah this is derek's new book now available at lostartpress.com and we have it available as hardcover and now as a pdf so if you like to read it on your phone or your iPad, you can do that too. So thank you for joining us, Derek. And we will look for you online for more and more variations on the cricket tables. Please do. Megan, right. it's been a pleasure. Thanks very much, everybody.